So a lot of people are neurodivergent. I feel like they have the imposter syndrome. They feel like they're a fraud all the time. So why is that so? Why are neurodivergent people more susceptible to having imposter syndrome? So an imposter syndrome is a anxiety-based phenomenon where you feel different than the people around you and you have this persistent internalized fear of being discovered as a fraud. And imposter syndrome comes from feeling different from your surroundings. And that difference can be overt or it could be implied, right? So if you are the first person in your family to attend university, that's a overt difference. You also could feel different, which is where the neurodivergence comes in, right? If you are ADHD and you are more or less capable of getting through the day, you feel really different, but you don't look different. So the the feeling of that can lead to a sense of imposter syndrome because our different brains lead us to take different pathways towards success. And, the, and when we become really aware of those different pathways, that's when a lot of times when people will say like, oh, okay, like, so I'm a fraud because I didn't do it like everybody else did it. That doesn't mean your way was worse. It just, but the awareness can drive the, uh, that sense of like deep anxiety. Um, and that also ties into perfectionism. So uh, why do a lot of neurodivergent people feel like they have to be perfect? And uh-huh. like, how does that tie into the imposter syndrome? I mean, well, I mean, it, they, they go hat in hand. That's a great question. Because one of the things that our brains tell us is like, oh, as long as I'm perfect, they won't find out I'm a fraud, right? As long as I do everything I'm supposed to do and do it perfectly, well, then it's, you know, that will keep me safe. It's, a, it's an irrational thought, but it doesn't mean that it's not powerful. So, yeah. you know, and a lot of times what the kids I work with will say is like, who've never really meaningfully been challenged before, they'll say things like, I used to be smart, but now I'm not, right? Or if I was any good at this, I wouldn't make mistakes. I always say to the people I work with, like, hey, on the other side of that story is, like, if you were playing a video game, you would want the bad guys to be getting harder. You would want the challenges to be getting steeper. Like, paradoxically, the better you get at something, the more you fail at it because the stakes are a lot higher. We yeah. want our kids to be in higher levels of stakes because that's where meaningful challenges for them. But we also need to be able to prepare, like support them for failing, struggling, being less than perfect, which is a thing they're probably not very used to. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like giving them a higher baseline instead of bringing things down for them. Um, like you said, the feeling of not feeling like they're as smart as they used to be, maybe because teachers don't really know how to um, either give them appropriate assignments for their level or, um, you know, they might not have the right uh, supports to begin with. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and and God, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. (laughs) Um, Well, and just, and those supports are, are everything because, you know, Imposter syndrome is something that you suffer in silence for. And perfectionism is one of those things that you'll be suffering. But one of the things that causes you to suffer is that every time you do it perfectly, when those stars align, you get so much praise where it starts to feel like it's your only way forward, right? So it becomes reinforced on the other side of it because it's like, oh, it feels terrible when I do less than perfect, but it feels amazing when I do perfect. So I should just feel amazing all the time. Like it's like in Happy Gilmore when he hits a hole and he's like, oh, that was easy. I should just hit the ball in the hole every time. It's like, well, that's not possible no matter how good you are, right? You you understand there's, there has to be lots of ways to succeed at things. You know, and I tell a lot of my college students, like, you know what they call some, you know what they call somebody um, with the lowest GPA in grad school? And they're like, what? I was like, doctor. You know, I mean, you don't have to be perfect to be successful. In fact, the further you go in your professional or academic journeys, it actually makes more sense to triage things and spend more energy on the things you're going to do and focus on 
rather than trying to be perfect at everything. That makes sense. So what um, in your uh, upbringing led you to this work? So I grew up as um, I grew up as a gifted kid in New Jersey in the 90s. Um, and I was from a really small town with a good school district. And luckily for me, you know, they were willing to support me. But they didn't have a lot of resources. And I sort of got my butt kicked. Um, and I remember thinking, like, if this town with all of its resources can't give me what I need, and I have parents who get it, and we had enough money to give me that extracurricular, um, you know, enrichment, what's it like for kids who don't have all of those things? So, you know, to me, I think you want to be the adult that you needed as a kid. And that's, to me, that's why what I do is such an honor. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are some tips uh, for developing resiliency as educators as we start the school year and, um, you know, have our new crop of students and uh, go through the highs and lows of the school? So the biggest thing that I can offer anybody here is that <clears throat> is that resilience doesn't come just from working hard right? It's very easy to, um, it's very easy to just say, well, resilience will come when the kids learn how to work hard. They'll just grind, right? But grinding is actually a great way to burn kids out. It's not a great way to increase resilience. Resilience is done best in small targeted chunks. So it's like, if you can do 15 push-ups, you're going to build resilience trying to do 16. 17, not 40, right? There's a concept in education and psychology that's helpful here. It's called the Yerkes-Dodson law. And basically the Yerkes-Dodson law tells us if it's too easy, we don't engage. If it's too hard, we can't engage. So we need to find the leading edge of learning. What's the best level to do this for that kid and then take the next step forward, right? 15 push-ups becomes 16, becomes 17. Um, and and resilience comes from normalizing struggle in the classroom as well, right? Kids are competitive. They want to do well. They don't want to be the only kid struggling, you know? And one of the teachers I work with um, here in New Jersey, every so often she'll just, she'll yell out struggle check. Like who's struggling right now? And the kids will pop their hands in the air. Like just, it normalizes that you feel like you're the only person in the room getting their butt kicked by this assignment and you look around like six, seven, eight of your friends are being like, I don't understand physics, right? So, you know, it's it's in being intentional with the education. It's being supported from a classroom environment. And then it's working with somebody like me, like a mental health professional to give the kids the skills. Because like when our bodies get upset, they can shut down. And then the interventions that would work if they were calm brain, calm body aren't going to work because... Don't have a calm brain, so you can't have a calm body. First, we got to regulate the kid. Then we do the intervention. I like how you worded that in terms of, um, you know, we're not necessarily going to push them until they burn out. So I think that's right. that's like a lot of people are doing, but take it in small chunks, really normalize if things are hard. So I, we've had a great conversation today about your work with districts, um, with uh, students who are homeschooling and also just how some of the um, things like perfectionism and imposter syndrome affect neurodivergent students. Out of everything we talked about today on the podcast, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? The thing that I really want listeners to remember is that the world is built for neurotypical people, right? There's 80% of people neurotypical, 20% of people are neurodivergent. So the systems that we operate in, schools, businesses, libraries, doctor's offices, are not built for neurodivergent people, which honestly makes sense, right? You, If you're hosting a dinner party and you've got one person who only is vegan, you're not going to make vegan food for everybody. You're going to make pot roast and have a vegan thing, right? 
But to further that metaphor, you need to make sure that the vegan thing exists and is accessible because sometimes you can't square, squeeze a square peg through a round hole. Sometimes we have to pivot into something aligned with those practices that meets the needs of this kid, right? Gifted education oh, yeah. is special education, which means that a lot of the interventions we're going to do are going to be multi-systemic and pretty damn big because that's what our kids are going to need to be successful. Very important to remember, especially as we're talking about uh, gifted students, twice exceptional students, and, uh, you know, supporting. Like, I think there's a lot of schools today that the gifted students are kind of left by the wayside. There's a lot more staffing for uh, kids that are on IEPs, 504s, um, and not enough in the district or at the schools for our GT kids. So um, where can people connect with you and find you online? So I have sort of two primary online presences. Um, my clinical practice is the neurodiversitycollective.com. We have uh, you know, a couple of people who work with me that where we see neurodivergent people all over the country. Um, and then for my speaking and training, um, that's drmatsakreski.com. Okay. Um, you know, when you have a very unique last name, it's easy to punch me into Google and I pop up in a couple different ways. Um, you know, and because sometimes it makes sense for me to work with your child, and sometimes it makes sense for me to work with your company of 6,000 employees, right? You know, we all interface with neurodivergent people, and the question becomes, how do we do that most effectively? Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. Um, I hope this really helps our uh, teachers as they start off the school year and they could gain some insight into best supporting their students. Thank you so much for having me. It was a treat.